Good afternoon and welcome to the governance webinar, everyone. Um, so, uh, uh, can everyone wave just to make sure they can see me and hear me? Hello. All right. Very good. We're off to a good start. My name is Yomika Bennett. I'm the executive director of the New York Charter School Association. And uh, as you hopefully know, that we as the association have been working very hard to help ensure that charter schools and their supporters have access to accurate information, especially during these unprecedented times. Uh, we're honored today to host uh, the conversation about governance, which we know has been a major source of questions and concerns. So now I will turn it over to Susie Carello of the, New York, me, of the SUNY Charter School Institute. Susie? Thanks, Yamika, and hi, everybody. Um, you know, <laughs> all of you get to see the faces of kids and teachers every now and again, I know, during this time. And, and I just want you to know that the Institute and I'm sure our partners at the State Education Department and the New York City Department of Education, and the New York City Charter School Center, as well as the New York Charter Schools Association feel the same way. We love to see your faces. It's really nourishing. It's extraordinary, actually, to see all of your faces together and know all of the work that you're doing every day. I really want to thank the center. Um, we had a great webinar earlier today about the budget, so thank you to them and the association who's helping us be more technologically capable, as well as the folks at the State Education Department and folks from New York City DOE. Um, everybody has been really working well together along with the crazy super strong team at the Institute in supporting the boards and leaders and teachers, all of you that are on this call with us. and. Um, you know, those of you that have a SUNY charter have heard me say this many times, we wanted you to have a charter so you could be super successful with kids, especially now in unprecedented times. And so our plan for the next hour is to have Carrie share some of the Institute's best thinking around governance. And then we're going to have Ralph Rossi, the Institute's general counsel, join, as well as David Frank. Thank you, David, from the State Education Department to answer any statewide related questions or maybe other specific questions from schools that are authorized by NYSID. So thanks again and Carrie, take it away. Thank you, Susie. Hi, I'm Carrie G. I'm the Associate Counsel at the Institute. Um, just to preface this, I am not your counsel. This is not legal advice. We do not have an attorney-client relationship. This is this is for educational purposes, uh, to help boards and leadership sort of govern in these times. I'm going to provide an overview of what we'll cover today. First, we're going to dive into the executive order um, impacting how public boards will continue to meet under the public officer's law. And then we're going to spend some time going over some big bucket items that you as a board and your school leadership should be thinking of when governing under the current situation. So in the context of governance during a difficult time, we need to be mindful of the tone we wish to set as leadership. Best practice would be to lead with calmness, understanding, continuity, and information. And when information is unknown, admitting as such, the providing assurances that we will seek out that information and figure it out. Since the initial uh, executive order, my last count is that there's been 13 additional executive orders. Several of them have dealt with schools directly. Um, we have provided, you can easily link to copies of those executive orders on the governor's website. We're going to focus on the first one here and the impact on how you meet under the open meetings law, which is under the public officer's law. But before we start, please note, this order is only through April, April 11th at this point. Do I think it will be extended? I do believe it will be extended, but I can't confirm that until the governor says it and puts it in writing. So if you're going to be meeting after April 11th, continue to check our website or the state education website to see if an extension has been made to these provisions um, and that they're still applicable. So let's go over the executive order. It read, to the extent necessary to permit any public body to meet and take such actions authorized by the law without permitting in public, in-person access to such meetings and authorizing such meetings to be held remotely by conference call or similar service, provided that the public has the ability to view or listen to such proceedings and that such proceedings are recorded and later transcribed. So let's break that down. The first part is to the extent necessary. Now, this is a question we have been receiving. Is it necessary for us to meet? This isn't a matter of being identified as essential under the current situation. There is an organization that needs to continue running. There are bills to pay, education to provide students, 
you need to prepare for the return of school, and you need to prepare for the next school year, which usually starts about this time of this school year. So yes, it is necessary to me. On a side note, in the materials that are linked to our website, we've provided a quick reference guide to where this executive order is applicable in the areas of the open meetings where it has not changed. And so that's a really great two-page resource to understand this executive order and its impact. So to go back, the question that, that we also are receiving is, well, how often should we meet? There's nothing in the law or the executive order which is obligating you to meet more often than you have, but likely more often than before. Whether you have been operating for one or 15 years, there is a need to manage, revisit, create, and innovate in this present situation. So the executive order suspends the requirement that boards meet in person or by video conference only, and that each location of a trustee participating by video be included in the notice and the public are allowed to attend. Therefore, boards may choose a platform that allows members to participate from their homes without public access to their homes, and board members may participate by telephone. That means, and this wasn't before, if they participate by telephone, they can count towards quorum, they can vote. So that's an important distinction under this order. Just to have a refresher, the executive order does not change what a meeting is. A meeting is any time a quorum of the board meets for the purpose of conducting school-related business. This does not include education or webinars. So if a quorum of your board is attending this webinar right now, open meetings law is not implicated. But if you get off of this meeting and get on a video call with a quorum of your board and start discussing school business, you will have implicated the open meetings law and you're having a meeting. So just remember that in the background as you're going through this or whether you're having a meeting or not. Okay, back to public access. So the order, the provision for in-person public access was suspended. You simply need to provide the public a way an ability to listen or view the meeting. This is easily accomplished through available technology. We're using one right now. Um, it doesn't say the, the public is allowed to participate in the meeting. That said, best practice as a board, you should still be able to consider the feedback of your school community, so you should devise a way to take in that feedback from the community. It can be emails before the meeting begins. It can be live chat like what's going on in this meeting and someone synthesizes that information. You may respond to certain things within the meeting or acknowledge them and say we will respond to them at a future meeting or we'll have school leadership respond to it in the normal course of communications from the school. This is very, very important to keep communication open at this time. It provides assurances to families that they're being heard as well as your staff. The final thing in the order was it's required to be recorded and transcribed. Now, recording is quite easy. So a lot of these platforms have recording mechanisms in them. So you easily can record, and then you just have to figure out how to, way to file that away in your corporate record. Transcription is another story. I don't know all the platforms and their abilities to transcribe, but I do know that outside services can be costly. So I would just be uh, do enough research on who can transcribe and how they can transcribe these, the recordings once they're finished. There is no time frame um, required in the executive order, so it would be interpreted as a reasonable amount of time under the current standards to get the meeting transcribed. That said, even though you're recording it and having to make a transcription, you haven't been alleviated of taking minutes. So you should still be taking minutes as you've always done at any board meeting. Just as a refresher, your minutes should reflect date, time, and location, as now location is virtual, so you should denote how it was made, how the meeting was done, what trustees were present. I would also denote how they participated, whether they were on video or telephone, what trustees were not present, a brief description of any discussion items, or you can include the agenda, and then a record of any voting that happened during that meeting and how the trustees voted on each one of those items. In your materials, you'll see that are linked, we provided a template for minutes. You do not have to use them. You can continue to use the template you have. We have it there just as a reference for you, um, just so, so you had a resource. 
executive session. So the executive order did not change the parameters of an executive session. That said, going into executive session could prove difficult with your technology. So you should run through how you are going to do executive session and block the public from that sector of the meeting. Um, you can set up a separate call. You can set up a separate platform. But you do have to remember you still are required to do the things that you need to do to go into executive session. So that means you first have to open in public session and then make a motion to go into executive session. In that motion in executive session, and the minutes should reflect one of the legal reasons to go into executive session. There are only certain reasons you can go into executive session. You should still use them. Our materials lay those out for you. So just as a refresher, make sure you're going into executive session for proper reasons. If you do take any votes during executive session, you will have to denote them in minutes. Just a reminder. After your minutes are done, please remember that you are to make them available to the public still. Two weeks after a regular board meeting, one week after an executive session, if votes were taken and minutes were taken at such executive session. If you're a SUNY authorized school, because I'm not sure about state ed's requirement, if you're a SUNY authorized school, you still have the requirement to submit those minutes within 30 days of the meeting. Just a reminder. Notice provisions have not changed under the executive session. So just as a refresher, if the meeting is scheduled more than a week in advance, notice has to be put up at least 72 hours prior. If it's less than a week, then it's to the extent practical. Again, notice should include date, time, and the means of which the meeting will be done. You provide to the news media outlet that you normally do. You post on the school's website. And the requirement is that you post in one or more public locations. Now, this has not changed under the executive order, but this means what you normally have done in the past is you've posted it somewhere in the school building, whether it's the main office where the board normally meets, it's posted physically somewhere. This can change across the state depending on where you are in the current situation. If you cannot get to your physical building right now, we at the Institute are interpreting this that you can post it where you're making edu the educational continuity plans available to families, whether that's on your website or there's a physical location where families are picking them up. Um, an idea is also to post it where families are accessing um, free, and redu free and reduced price lunch families are accessing food. Um, so right now that would be just sort of the reasonable interpretation of that requirement of notice and posting. In the materials, we've also linked to some sample language that you can use in a notice, just a resource and just some sample language, language if you uh, need any. All right, so the second part, we're going to talk about big bucket items you should be thinking about as an organization. There is a quick reference guide as to what I'm about to go through, so you don't have to take notes during this. We have a, I have a guide that lays all of these things out as they are in the presentation. I want you to remember this is not an exhaustive list. This is meant to be a big bucket list of items you should be thinking about and you should adjust to your school community. We will go over other resources the Institute has available, but the biggest thing to remember when you're going through these list of items is that as a board member, remember that you are oversight. Your leadership is management and you must still act in those manners. So you are oversight, leadership is management. You must stay abreast of all things on a broad level and offer support to your leadership team when, it, when the leadership identifies needs and, and resources. This doesn't mean you can't pitch in, but you can take something off a leader's plate or work out, but offer, don't dictate. You want to make, it's imperative in a time like this to work with your school leadership in a cohesive and cooperative manner. So the biggest, uh, the first bucket would be government. The first thing you need to think about, how often is the board checking in with school leadership? Now this doesn't have to be the board as a whole. This can be the board chair or another member that is designated. Um, right now it's probably happening on a daily or every other day basis with the school leader just to check how the school organization is going and how things are moving ahead, plans that are being made all of those things. You just want to make sure that you're staying abreast. The second thing is the frequency. You want to determine how often you're going to be meeting while going through this. What is necessary as a board? You'll also want to 
review who is responsible for setting up a meeting because now we're if you're doing them virtually you have to make sure it's someone with an IT background and knows how to do this or train board members who might not know how to use certain platforms or or have not used them before just to have a refresher or a, a training with them um, who is responsible for notices if that is changed and you want to peg who's responsible for re the recording, the transcription, the minutes, the filing of those things with corporate records just to ensure those obligations are met. You also want to review who on the administrati administrative staff will re be reporting. Um, normally, lots of boards have dashboards or set reports that are given by certain individuals on the, the admin team. Will that change? So is there certain information that can't be reported on right now because we're living in sort of a virtual world? And what information in addition do you need? So you want to talk to your leadership team at what information they're currently collecting and that, that can be given to you on a regular basis so you can monitor as we go through um, this time period. A big thing you want to do right now uh, as towards governance is review your bylaws. You want to make sure it's, they're compatible with how you're going to be meeting in the short term. Um, you can assign this to your executive or governance committee, and if you have uh, an attorney and, or counsel, uh, it's a great time to bring them in to review your bylaws. Things you want to be looking at is you want to review delegations for decision making. So do you want to amend the bylaws to empower a board chair or the executive committee or a, a, a group of members um, to make decisions in emergency situations if that's going to be, become necessary? You want to review delegations for signatory responsibilities. Um, the reason why you want to do this is if who is assigned becomes sick or has to take care of a sick family member, is there a backup plan of who else can take over those responsibilities uh, on behalf of the currently designated person? You want to think of everything as a backup plan for the backup plan, and that's really how you want to view this situation. Succession planning. Does the board have a sufficient number of members to govern? Now in New York, you're required to have five board members. If you have five board members, that's great. But you want to think of what happens if a certain number of board members become sick or are unable to participate. Will the board be able to still make quorum and vote on matters and continue to govern the school? So what are your contingency plans in that situation? Another concept of succession planning you want to plan for all of the admin staff that are reporting to you and reporting certain information. Is there a second? Do they have a second in case they can't report or gather the information for a time period? Is there a second that they can use and knows how to gather that information and report it to the board? Again, backup plan for the backup plan. Finally, do you have a communication plan? Now, many of you have already started communications with your families, obviously, because we have been in this situation for several weeks, but you really want to sit down and look at it and know what you're going to do moving forward if it's going to stay the same. Um, I always recommend a board member to be part of the communication team so boards understand what communications are going out to the school community from the school. Um, you want to make sure you know who handles media, external communications, and you want to make lines of communication clear and known to your staff and your school community. You want to avoid mixed messages and confusion where you can. Everyone is at a heightened stress level from your staff to your parents. So again, you want to be calm and informative. You want to communicate with parents and guardians regularly and frequently. Make sure everyone knows that the board is active and involved and let them know that you are in trust in, in touch with the district, local agencies, state agencies, your authorizer, and that you will provide information as you know it. If you don't know something, say you don't know something. Don't guess. Don't give false hope. Don't make, yes, don't guess. Just say, I don't know, but I will find out that information and we'll make sure we'll get you an answer as soon as we can. Finally, you want to leverage your parent-teacher organization if you have one. They're really great at communicating out to a school community, so if you can leverage them, I recommend doing so and involving them in your communication process. And finally, you should prepare for how you will disseminate any difficult news that happens to the school community. Unfortunately, we do know that some of our school communities will be affected um, in a grave way by COVID-19. 
So you want to make sure that you're prepared of who and how you will convey that information to your school community. Please remember that you must balance information with someone's privacy. So you want to think those things through right now instead of when you're in the situation. The second area is uh, educational continuity. Um, the schools have done a great job from our schools to SED schools to DOE schools of handing in their educational continuity plans. Um, what you want to know as a board is will those, can you continue those plans for the end of the school year? I am not saying you will have to continue them for the end of the school year because that decision has not been made. What I am saying is will you be able to in case that is the decision that is made? So again, preparing for the worst case scenario, can you do that and what are those? Now as a board, you want to know an overview of what those education plans are. How are students learning in your school community? And you want to know by subgroups how that information is being relayed and how they're being taught. But you want, and you want to know if it's different by grade level. So I would talk to school leadership about what information and data they can provide you as towards touch points with students, um, the ways they're accessing their education, the ways they're receiving support and services, just so you have a handle on what your school is doing for its students. One other th another thing that you need to know is what are the plans and educational supports for when students return to school? Um, now this could be this year or this could be next year. Now if it's next year, kids will be out of school for a very long time. Your leadership team is probably going to be working on different types of professional development and preparation for kids to return. You want to make sure as a board that you are providing the resources and the supports that your school leadership identifies as being necessary to get school kids back on track when they return to school. So that is your job as a board to support your leadership in that way. Workforce. So huge responsibility. You're an employer. So Who's handling your human resources responsibilities and who is staying abreast of all the federal and state guidance and requirements that are going to be coming out in the next few months? Whether it is in-house or it is something you outsource, you want to make sure you are meeting new obligations that are coming out as an employer. Do the staff currently understand their expectations? Now everyone is working remotely. Do they understand the expectations that are laid out for them? Has leadership set um, what will be evaluations? What will be supports for staff to do their work? Is you, are you creating a work environment in this virtual world? Um, you want to start thinking about not only how will staff be evaluated, but how you'll make determinations for staff coming back, or if you're in a leadership um, search right now. So how are you going to continue those things moving forward? If school reopens this year, how will the school determine if all the staff are willing to come back? So if we return to school this year and you don't have enough staff to come back, what are your contingency plans to ensure that you can still conduct school? Finally, how will the school conduct staff recruitment for next year as that process normally starts about this time? So you want to start really thinking about these things as a board to ensure that when school does come back into your brick and mortar building, it can. Operations. Now, uh, this is the big topic right going on right now because this is the time of year we do that. Emissions and lottery. So has your lottery and emissions process been affected by this? Um, we have guidance on our website as well as I know State Ed does as well uh, as to uh, the leniency that has been provided. But again, keep in contact with us with any questions you have. But you really want to continue to think about how you will monitor emissions for next school year as it could change. And as you know, enrollment is directly tied to your fiscal resources, so you want to ensure that you're going to continue to be able to make your enrollment for next school year. So again, how will the, you monitor these, this information as a board? Facilities. As you know, facility projects have been affected uh, by the current situation. So what are your contingency plans? Um, if those facility projects were tied to growth in your school, and you might not be able to grow in the manner that you can't want to, you need to be talking to your authorizer uh, and be a thought 
partner, so we can be a thought partner, number one, but two, if you need a revision, we have to start processing it and thinking about that. So if you're coming into problems with your facility issues, please, rat sooner rather than later, contact your authorizer so we can talk it through with you and so we can know what needs to come down the pipeline. Finances. So most schools have this, but I know some schools who still write checks. Electric payments have been established for all your accounts, so you can do this in a virtual manner. Um, you may want to visit your financial policies and procedures manual to see that it's still applicable in the current virtual situation. And another really important thing is how will internal controls work? It could change now that you're no longer in a bricks and mortar building, so you want to review those policies. You can do so through your accountants in your accounting firm, and uh, it's highly recommended to work at that with them so you understand uh, how you're going to conduct business in the, in the short term. Uh, Compliance-related matters. So, you know, there's a bunch of submissions our schools submit to us, and I know they submit to state ed certain things. Are you still, are people still on your staff um, doing those things? Again, is there a second in, in person to that, to that identified individual who will be doing those things? Um, I know we have coming up that you submit admission summaries and facility documents, and by the end of June, there's a budget that gets submitted. So are you, may, are you ensuring that those things stay on time and will be submitted? And finally, resources. There's a lot of changes in information coming out on a daily basis. It's a lot of information. Is there someone on staff who is assigned to stay abreast of all of those things coming out? Um, it is a lot of information. It is great if one person or two people or people can be assigned to different subjects to take that information and keep distilling it down and reporting back to the board so everyone understands how this is changing as we move forward. Finally, culture. I know this sounds weird because when we talk about culture, we're usually talking about culture that is created inside a brick and mortar building. But how do you create a culture when your world has become virtual? Well, it starts with the board and the leadership. You set the tone. So what are you doing to monitor and address your school community culture? Students, you know, we talk about, when we talk about school safety, we talk about reaching every kid because we know that's the best way to thwart school violence is to have a kid say something. Um, in this context, are we reaching out to all the kids to know that they're okay? Are the teachers checking in with them? How often is that happening? Are they getting the supports they need? And, and you know, sometimes the teacher is the best relationship a kid has. So you want to make sure that that is occurring because uh, the school is, can be a family, and you want to make sure that that continues and those touch points happen. Same with families. Are you having touch points with families? One, to ensure that they can access the educational continuity plan for their kiddos. Also, are they having other problems? We have a lot of schools, and I know SED as well um, does, that have wonderful partnership relationships with organizations that help outside of school. So we have to make sure that we, if we can be a resource as a school, that we are a resource as a school. So definitely leverage those partnerships and that information to your school-wide community as they go through some pretty difficult things for the next few months. Finally, your leadership and your staff. This is a really difficult time. People are trying to do their jobs from home. Uh, I know a lot of people are worried about their kids and they're trying to do all this with their own kids at home or they're worrying about parents and grandparents. So is your staff being checked on? And are leadership checking in on teachers and all of the rest of the teacher's assistants and all of the other people who make your school happen? And then as a board, I always highly recommend check on your leadership. You know, the leadership sometimes is always checking on everyone else and no one is checking in on them and asking them, hey, by the way, how are you doing? Do you need anything? You may not be able to offer anything but an ear, but that can really help in a time like this while everyone's juggling a lot, a lot of things at one time. I also highly recommend not only do you ask, but you compliment. You know, people are working really hard and trying to figure out how to do a lot of things all at once in a very, very stressful time. So it's very important that if you see someone doing hard work, you tell them, hey, you're doing a really great job because sometimes that's all someone needs to hear when they're having a really difficult time and they just need that affirmation. So 
that can go a long way with your school culture and setting a tone of school leadership. Finally, I want to tell you about our new resource center. So this just timed out this way. So the Institute has created a new resource center uh, that we officially launched today. It is intended for SUNY Charter School board members, leaders, applicants, researchers, and parents and other members of the community. It includes a variety of information um, from the SUNY authorization process to key benchmarks and compliance requirements, as well as model documents and guidelines and tools and templates. Um, you'll notice on the right-hand side, it's broken down by area. Um, but in addition to SUNY authorized schools, because I know that's not all who's on this call right now, um, the board member section is really applicable to any board that runs any type of school organization. We have a calendar that takes you month by month and suggests questions in certain areas from academics to finance to compliance to legal, just to make sure that you're sort of covering a basis of topics. And we really want it to be a resource for everybody. Other resources, we've provided websites from the United States Department of Education to State Ed, to our website, to the association, to the New York City Charter School Center. As you can see, we all have uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 sections of our website to offer materials um, as quickly as we can get them out to you, our school community, so you stay informed. Um, but I always do stress, you know, pose questions, call us. We want to make sure people have more information than not. So finally, I just want to end with, you know, there's a lot of emotions going on right now. And out of fear, sometimes the best human emotion that comes out is this need to help. So I just want to remind you the way you help is you lead and you support and you govern. And I know you all can do that because you're really great schools and trying really hard. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Carrie. So we will transition to taking some questions from the chat. Um, and we've seen a couple already that I think we can um, field first. But just one theme that's already come out and to clarify that following this webinar, um, we will use any chat content to create and share out an FAQ document. And so if we don't get to your question or you have a specific concern that the FAQ doesn't address, we encourage you to reach out directly to your authorizer. And please note that today is not going to be a broad ranging Q&A. We're going to focus exclusively on governance questions. So for other topics and updates, I encourage you to join our weekly webinar, which we host on Tuesdays at 4. And we're also happy to field requests for future deep dive topics. So uh, one of the questions um, the, that we saw earlier in the chat um, is around transcription services. And so thanks to those of you who use services and had some to recommend. Um, my, my guess is at this point, given this sort of unprecedented and uncharted waters, um, David, uh, Susie, Ralph, Carey, that you all don't have um, necessarily platforms that you have experience with, but certainly I, will, um, I, won't, I won't assume and will ask that question. So I don't think the I have not yep. particular Sorry. preference. whatever works best for for you and great um are there if there aren't are there other questions in the chat carrie that was very thorough i think by evidence of the uh of the lack of questions or that the major theme is about um wanting to make sure that they have access to um, the materials from today uh the deck the uh recording and the documents you reference will all be posted um, both on the SUNY website as well as on ours. Um, so I will, I will give it some wait time um, to see if there are other pressing questions that folks have and then we will conclude. I echo the thank you, um, the, the thank yous um, to uh, the Institute team and to David um, for making yourselves available as you're doing on such regular basis. I know you all are um, burning the candles on many ends with all of your personal and professional obligations right now. And I think your uh, commitment to schools is, um, is admirable. So without seeing a lot of other um, uh, questions in the chat, um, if you want um, information about the Tuesday webinar, um, please email membership at nycharters.net and we can make sure that you get the information. Um, but I'll turn it back over to you, make it or wrap it up. 
All right, thank you, Anna. Thank you, everyone on the call. Um, so I think Anna summed it up really well. Um, thank you, everybody, for their efforts today. Um, certainly, SUNY um, Charter School Institute, thank you all so much, Carrier, uh, for that excellent presentation as well, and Susie for helping make it all happen and possible, always. Um, I want to just, um, just remind everyone, again, of the website. Uh, we put it up on the link, and hopefully we can maybe get it up again, um, newyorkcharters.org slash a resource center. Uh, we will all have a recording of today's presentation and discussion. Um, thank you again. Everyone be well, be safe. Reach out if you have any more questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.